Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that I'm the only one in this panel that is supposed to speak about the subject that is in actually on the agenda, namely the restrictions of international law in contending with terror, and I will try to do that. First of all, we have to understand that the restrictions and limitations are not always legal. Very often, these uh, limitations are extra legal, meta juridical, and first of all, you have political limitations. The chief political restriction is the tendency of countries worldwide to distinguish between terrorists, our terrorists, and your terrorists. There are good terrorists and there are bad terrorists. And that is extremely prominent in quite an extraordinary manner with regards to the Arab countries and Islam countries who refused quite forcefully to acknowledge the fact that what Palestinian terrorists do make for any uh, terror act whatsoever. So before you think that this is a problem only of the Muslim Arab world, allow me to correct this mistake. The uh, problem exists even in the U.S. The U.S. distinguishes between Al-Qaeda terrorists, my terrorists, and air terrorists in Chechnya, your terrorists. The U.S., for example, uh, caught in Afghanistan and uh, brought to Guantanamo for quite a number of years terrorists from China, but it refuses to let them go lest the uh, uh, Chinese would uh, actually uh, harass them, and so some of them have already passed away or were actually imprisoned in the Bermuda Island, and for the first time in their lives, they arrived in a place such as Bermuda, and they don't have to see to their livelihood, and all the rest would be sent to the island of Palau, which is a different type of paradise. Why? Because that is against China. So we have to distinguish between what is against uh, the U.S., which is totally illegal, what is against uh, Russia is totally uh, allowed, and against China, well, here we're not that sure. Other restricts, restrictions which are uh, para-juridical uh, are pragmatic ones. If you take the attempt to prevent suicide bombers, how can one prevent that? You threaten them with death penalty? I mean, that's exactly what they're looking for. What are you doing in order to guarantee that that individual would decide on his own to avoid doing this in advance? What do you do as far as deterrence is concerned, not in uh, as far as punishment after the deed is concerned, because there's po no post factum uh, penalty there. So there's nothing to do as far as deterrence is concerned. Israel tried to demolish houses, a policy that we have abstained from for the past few years. And this policy, practically speaking, was not necessarily uh, proving itself. Uh, it is a controversial issue nonetheless, and legally it is strictly forbidden. So the question is, what can be done? Uh, Israel, at the beginning of this decade, tried to uh, uh, work out an international treaty, a draft of it, which probably five or ten countries would have joined ultimately, but even this draft is not worth the paper upon which it was written, because it said nothing. Why didn't it say anything? Because we don't know what to say. Who in this hall can know, can tell us what to do as far as deterrence is concerned? And I repeat, deterrence against suicide bombers. May you rise and say. Now, beyond those uh, meta-juridical uh, restrictions, there are some legal ones as well. And here we start a certain dialogue. I'm sorry, the international law is not determined in this conference, even if we're going to reach a consensus here, quite surprisingly, and we all hold the same opinion. So what? Nothing to it. In the U.S., uh, they would say, okay, this and another dollar would give you a cup of coffee, and that's it. You have to get to a situation in which the practice used by states is the one that would adopt a particular solution for a legal problem. And it takes time until the practice of our countries formulate. And I have to say that not very often, every now and then, there come a time in which a dominant event, a definitive event emerges that changes the whole picture, and then 
all of a sudden solutions are found that couldn't be found many years that preceded it. The dominant definitive event of the last few years is obviously 9-11. Thanks to 9-11, uh, all of a sudden, international law came up with solutions to problems that beforehand were uh, considered incurable for many years. So let's start with a definition. And I'm very sure that you keep hearing that there is no legal binding uh, definition for terrorism, but that is not so. That is not true. There is a definition, and the definition appears in a covenant that deals with the prohibition of the funding or financing of terror acts of 1999. Today, this covenant, because of 9-11, almost all countries are parties in that covenant, and uh, in many of its parts, it's binding because of a UN resolution that was accepted immediately after 9-11, and that is a binding resolution. In this covenant, we do find a definition, and the definition is that those who perpetrate uh, acts that bring about death or uh, damage to civilians who do not participate in hostile events to intimidate a civil population or to force a government to change its policy. What can be clearer than that? It is true that, by the way, the Arab countries and Islamic countries still continue to talk against that definition, but it is actually applied since 9-11. The UN Security Council uh, has a counter-television, a counter-terrorism uh, committee that works very, very uh, effectively in coordination of the international campaign against terrorism. So by the definition, well, this problem has been solved. Well, uh, turning in uh, extradition, uh, it was the norm that there was no extradition for uh, such acts, and a terror act is done for political uh, reasons. Well, we do have a European covenant against or con concerning extradition that uh, determines that terror acts are not considered political acts and uh, therefore the extradition does not apply. There are bilateral uh, covenants that uh, the U.S. is always also related uh, where the very same thing is said. It is clearer and clearer that terror acts are not political and this is uh, the, why the extradition uh, article applies. Number three. There's a question whether non-state actors can carry out or per perpetrate armed attack according to the Article 51 of the UN Charter. Until 9-11, it was debated, but no longer so. There is a binding resolution of the UN Security Council, also of NATO and also of the American countries. You name it. It is very clear today that indeed uh, non-entity actors can perpetrate an armed uh, attack uh, in accordance with the uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter against which one can uh, issue self-defense act. Today it's clear, but it wasn't that clear before 9-11. And ultimately, what do you do? And indeed, once there is an armed offensive, it was done by terrorists, but these terrorists are not collaborating necessarily with a country or a state. If a state collaborates with them, then that is an easy answer. This is the script of Afghanistan of, of uh, 2001. The Taliban regime, in its evilness and folly, decided to collaborate with Al-Qaeda, and the result was a war between the U.S. and its allies against Afghanistan, and the uh, Taliban regime was defeated in Afghanistan, and now it's being defeated in Pakistan. Do those are think that it's going to revive are wrong. But the question is, what happens when there's no state involved? And the answer to this was found by a number of countries, such as Israel or Turkey. If you take the Turkish case, just to illustrate this more clearly, against Turkey, there's const constantly terror acts who originate in North Iraq. But behind them, there's no government. The government in Baghdad does not stand behind them, nor any governmental entity. Even the yeah, formal Iraqi Kurdish uh, population are against them. So what can the Turkish government do? Just uh, show them the other cheek to say, oh, we're sorry, we can't do anything about it? No. The Turkish are sending their own army to northern parts of Iraq every now and then in pursuit of those Kurdish uh, terrorists with this degree of success or another. We did the very same thing in Lebanon, by the way, a number of times at the time in which the government in Lebanon could not prevent terror acts against us. So 
Were, did we abstain from doing something, from uh, reacting? No, we did enter Lebanon against those terrorists, but not against the, te the Lebanese government. In 1982, what we call the First Lebanon War, which is a totally mistaken uh, uh, name. It wasn't a war against Lebanon. We never fired uh, one bullet against Lebanese soldiers, and they didn't shoot at us. There was full cooperation between us and the former representatives of Lebanon in southern Lebanon. And Lebanese uh, soldiers, uh, closed themselves in their camps and abstained from reacting. And in 1993, there was not one incident. So that has an answer. And by the way, I developed this idea in a very detailed manner, and I'm very happy to say that so far, two judges of the international law, the uh, Dutch one and the German, accepted my opinion, and most of them uh, abstained from expressing their opinion in a ruling that was done on the matter of Congo on this matter, but most of the uh, justices abstained from uh, giving their uh, verdict. So I can say that always a solution is found. I gave you four examples to which uh, solutions were found, and I can give you so many examples where solutions haven't been uh, found, and I'll give you two. One is that it is agreed upon that in times of war, civilians deserve protection uh, if they do not take part, a direct part in those uh, hostilities they do not take part, a uh, direct part in hostilities, as we said. Now, the question is, what is direct participation in hostilities? And about this, I have to say that there is uh, an organized debate and has been going on for five years under the ages of the International Red Cross Organization, which has been concluded recently with a fiasco. In other words, the International Red Cross uh, published recently, about 10 days ago, an instrument on its behalf that it calls the Interpretive Guide Concerning uh, Guidance. So it says the speaker concerning what is direct participation in hostilities and those Western experts, most of them, except for my, me, your humble uh, servant, uh, disagree with the Red Cross. There's a very serious problem here as far as the State of Israel is concerned that hasn't been resolved yet, and that is the revolving door. Namely, there's no uh, argument about the fact that if a person leaves uh, his house to carry out, to perpetrate a terror act, and is caught en route to while doing what he's doing or on way back, he is a directly participant in hostilities. However, because the determining uh, definition is while he is doing or perpetrating the act, what happens if he's just resting at home now and the following day he goes out again to perpetrate the very same act? This is called the phenomenon of the farmer at day and fighter by night. The Israeli uh, uh, position is unequivocal. The minute that repeats itself, the minute you do have a revolving door, that particular individual serves actually as a target, as a permissible target for attack at any given time when he is caught. Because I don't have to say to you that pragmatically uh, the chance to catch him is not while perpetrating the deed, but rather when he rests at home. So this is not the position of the International uh, Red Cross. We try to overcome this problem with a uh, 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 proposal of uh, compromise, which was rejected by the International Red Cross, and we're back to square one. But that doesn't mean that we didn't make any uh, progress, because I have to say that five years of clarification of five words, more or less, really honed the subject to many, many of us, and many of us have changed our minds. I have to tell you, uh, i give you an example of myself, that when we started, the Israeli formal position was that H2, uh, those words are not the binding uh, uh, article that is obligatory to Israel, and I actually hosted that uh, flag with great uh, upliftment until one clear day, I had this uh, enlightenment, if uh, you will, and all of a sudden I thought, and what about those reserve soldiers? We have to remember we're all doing our reserve service, and that means that we are civilians. For example, 11 uh, months a, a year, but for one month we turn to be found, but it will be. The second example has been mentioned by Danny earlier, and that is uh, the human shields. And the international law is unequivocal here. Using human shields uh, uh, 
is a, crim uh, a cr criminal uh, act. And if we assume that one belligerent side has used those human shields, what does it mean about the enemy? What does it mean about the other side? And there is an international covenant that says quite, I have to say, really in a way that really makes me shiver every time I he read it, that if that is the case, the other side should continue to uh, adhere to all the rules of the international law. Namely, you are breaching international law, but I am bound by it. And if that is the case, you receive a prize for breaching international uh, law because the law did not change itself in my favor along the way. And that is unreal. Uh, my position is that indeed the principle of proportionality that you've heard about in theory is definitely valid, but proportionality changes altogether. And if I attack a target where there are human shields, I need not uh, adhere to the regular uh, principle of proportionality. I do have to uh, adhere to it, but in a totally different way. In other words, if uh, regularly I would not kill more than two or three civilians in that particular locus, then in this case of using human shields, I am allowed to kill many times more than that. And still, I would not argue that I'm allowed to kill 100 thousand or one million so as you can see there is some progress made but there are some places where the thing is still stuck the result of this uh, is that very often people good important people would want to just break the rules and say the international law is flawed and we have to find solutions come up with new paradigms this is uh, the very uh, uh, like um, uh, the phrase liked by many uh, academicians today we have to come up with new paradigms this is folly ladies and gentlemen for three reasons first of all there's no chance in the world to Today to bring about a situation in which the international uh, society would accept a new international covenant with new solutions. Nothing of the sort. And I, in this field, I appear very often before governments, and I can tell you that this is their position, even if I uh, beg to differ. This is the universal position nowadays. Nobody would agree to another international covenant on the subject. That's one. Number two, uh, we have to remember that the problems very often are not with the law. The problems very often are with the jurists, including justices, including the courts and the Supreme Courts in the U.S. and in Israel who write really uh, a folly, uh, things which are a pure folly. Uh, for example, in the U.S., you know that there is a key uh, ruling that determines uh, uh, that uh, counterterrorism serves as an armed uh, and non-international uh, armed uh, conflict. The, this war that is waged all over the globe, that's an armed conflict which is non-international. Uh, so if it isn't, what is it? Those who wrote it uh, do not know what they're saying. Unfortunately, in a ruling of the Supreme Court in Israel, one can find similar things or parallel things, and what needs to be rectified is not the law, but rather the jurists, including the judges. Number three, we have to remember that when you go and opt for new paradigms, we don't have anything from which we can uh, draw very stable, clear conclusions. Namely, if you take the existing law, and I pointed at the problematic nature of the existing law, we still have uh, the terra firma. We have a very solid ground upon which we are standing, and around this there are various swamps that we'd better not get into, and we're trying to dry up those swamps with this level of success or another. But when we opt for new paradigms, there's no solid ground under our feet. We start from scratch. Will that improve the situation? It will only come to a situation in which the war, the fog of war, will turn into the fog of the laws of war, and I object. Thank you.